Welcome back to Church in the World. This is it. This is the final part of our discussion of the ELCA statement uh, on sexism. And it's going to be then the last official entry in our walk through the social statements of the ELCA. This st social statements from 2019, so we've caught up to the present. Of course, tomorrow there will, as always, be a bit of an uh, appendix episode. And that's going to provide a little Pentecost denouement to this series. I hope this has been helpful for you. But today we're going to talk in our ultimate episode, or, well, penultimate episode, however you count them, about part four of this social statement, the ELCA calls for action and new commitments into society. My hope is that a lot of this, if you followed me so far, and if you followed this series thus far, none of this is likely to surprise you. So we're going to go through this statement. I'm going to pause on just a couple, four, four or five of these um, different points um, and, and do a little bit of riffing to, to talk and comment. But this should be fairly quick. So this is on Article 31, and that's at page 9. This church, the LCA, teaches that the God who justifies expects all people to seek justice in earthly relationships, structures, and systems. The LCA calls for sustained and renewed efforts through which women, girls, and gender nonconforming people experience greater equity and justice. The following commitments express this church's firm hope for renewed social relationships and structures that benefit the common good. The LCA commits itself to advocate for and support laws, policies, and practices that respect diverse bodies rather than discriminating against, objectifying, or devaluing them. Women, girls, and people who identify as non binary must not be deprived of their human or civil rights. So, full stop, okay? Human and civil rights. That means that regardless of theological opinions about sexuality in the church or, or about gender or any of this nonsense, the ELCA is saying, if you're a Christian, you believe that every person must have their human and civil rights preserved, right? Period. So this raises big questions, right? Think of the bathroom bill controversy. Think about um, the, the mass kind of hysteria around uh, transgendered, uh, transgender people. Um, there's this real tension around that. And honestly, as, as a cisgender person, uh, which is what I am, uh, I'm not able to parse that with any sort of authenticity, other than that I'm keenly aware that being trans as well as being female is an immense, uh, I'm sorry, being transgender, being female, being uh, gender expressive in a female way, being non-binary, all of these things are extremely extremely dangerous in our society, right? Because all of them carry with them a heightened risk of danger and death, right? As well as a decreased, uh, generally a decrease in income and decrease in economic success. It's mind boggling how thoroughly the system seems to be designed to deprive these people, such people of rights, of protections, and of safety, and even of basic security. That's a real problem. And we're going to get specifically to violence in the next article, right? So this church commits to advocate for and support the eradication of gender-based violence within the church and more broadly in society by addressing both the systemic aspects of such violence and the personal responsibility of those who perpetrate harm, right? So we need to address the system that creates people who would do this violent acts against people. But we also need to, of course, hold those who engage in sex acts responsible personally. We commit to advocate for and support medical research, healthcare delivery, and access to equitable and affordable healthcare services, including reproductive healthcare, 
that honor how bodies differ and eliminate discrimination due to sex, biological, gender, or sexual orientation, right? And so this ties into our healthcare statement, our abortion statement, our economic justice statement, all of that goes into that. Um, and it even says, see caring for health or shared endeavor and abortion. If you want to see discussions of both of those topics, you can go back to those video series where we have a lot more time and detail. Um, but here, what I will say is that reproductive health care and health care in general is often extremely difficult for people, especially uh, people who aren't just uh, female or transgender or non-binary, but people who have uh, intersectional vulnerabilities or minority statuses. Uh, it's very difficult to get quality health care for some of those folks, especially in, in the United States of America right now. And that's not acceptable. We have to make good health care available to all. And that includes reproductive health care. And that includes everyone, regardless of all of these issues of sex, gender, or sexual orientation. Um, they're human beings. God loves them. And we are commanded to love them. Period. Um, it's not loving to let someone just suffer illness or death. Article 35, we commit to advocate for and support economic policies, regulations, and practices that enhance equity and equality for women and girls with special concern for raising up women and girls who experience intersecting form of oppression. This is, you know, economic stuff. And you can see uh, the economic uh, uh, social statements, sufficient, sustainable livelihood for all. And of course, I already did a video set on that as well. Article 36, advocate for and support multifaceted understandings of social and economic roles so that neither our human traits, such as courage or compassion, nor our callings, such as business leader or stay-at-home parent, are dictated by our sex, biological and gender. Encourage and empower all people to use their gifts for the sake of the common good, whether at home, at work, or in the public sphere, right? So this basically says we need to blow up this idea, right, that... Uh, one, that our sex and gender dictate our human traits, like men are courageous and women are compassionate. Like, that's nonsense, and we need to blow that up. And our callings, business leader, stay-at-home parent, what, whatever functions we have, however we use our gifts and our traits, neither of those has anything to do with, or should be dictated by, at least, neither of those should be dictated by our sex or gender, right, for any individual or any person. Um, that's just something we're rejecting out of hand, right? We need to we need to get beyond that through advocating and supporting multifaceted understandings of social and economic roles, right? And so this is actually really big because this is about gender stereotypes. This is about kind of traditionally male or traditionally female roles, all this stuff. And none of it's about saying you can't engage in those roles if you fit those traditional categories but that those categories need to stop being traditional and in fact should really stop being categories that intersect with any sort of regularity um, uh, as a matter of course, right? The, the notion that only women cook, right? Which of course uh, is to me a fairly old uh, notion, quite outdated, which is by the way, proof that these things can shift over time. But the notion that only women normally are skilled at cooking or the notion that only men go to war this stuff is falling apart slowly, but we need to advocate for and support different understandings so that we really get beyond this as a society as a whole in all aspects. Article 37. We advocate for and support resources for families of various configurations and the communities in which they live. We empower parents and all who raise or care for children or other family members to nurture, protect, and provide for their households in ways that do not reinforce gender-based stereotypes. In particular, we advocate for institutional changes that support and encourage men and boys to participate in all family roles associated with the home, caregiving, parenting, and nurturing. This relates to the previous one. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. We advocate for and support legal reforms, humane policies, and adequate services for migrants, images, refugees, and asylum seekers, especially those who experience intersecting forms of oppression. See the social message immigration. We didn't do it because it wasn't a social statement, but there's a social message on immigration. And that is the basis for this, right? So, we're, so we have to remember, if we're going to get to justice, right? Because of intersectionality, right? As you see here, you can't just do justice for women, right? Or just justice for women and trans people and non-binary people. And no, and you can't just do justice around imaging God and liturgy. 
uh, and justice for equal, equitable employment, right? No, we've got to talk about immigration. We've got to talk about healthcare. We've got to talk about economic justice. We've got to talk about racism. We've got to talk about all these things because they're all bound up together. Article 39, we advocate for and support portrayals in entertainment, media, and advertising that do not objectify or stereotype people, but rather show all people as capable of the wide variety of human characteristics and roles, right? So we want to advocate for and support um, in all media images that diversify what's presented to, to folks, right? Because that's part of where these self-reinforcing narratives come from. And then Article 40, the last one. We advocate for and support means for increasing women's participation in local, state, and national politics with special attention to the proportionate advocacy and support needed by those who face intersecting forms of oppression. So we believe that women need to be involved in politics and that, in fact, everyone should be involved in politics. And where there's a disparity that doesn't reflect the, the, the population uh, demographics, then we know that something's going on in terms of a power differential. And if you notice, that's what this is all about. It's about power differentials and how we create and sustain them through the stories we tell, through the products we consume, through the language we use, through the images of God that we preach from the pulpit, through how we compensate people, how we incentivize or de-incentivize certain reproductive habits or activities, from the ways in which we differently price medications, from the ways in which medical studies are arranged. All of these things are articulations of our systems, our stories, our narratives, who we think we are and who we imagine God to be. And so as we go through life, continuing as church in the world, let us continue to discern what is it that we are saying? Because that's what this is all about at the end of the day, right? That's what all the social statements are for. That's what all this seven-week project has been about is trying to get us to think a little bit more through this lens of the social statements, some of which date back to 1991. Are we representing what these social statements say? Are we living into them? And if we're not living into these narratives, these values, and these teachings, which narratives, values, and teachings are we living into and why? I hope that you have enjoyed this series. I hope that you have a understanding of where the ELCA is. I hope that you've heard that the ELCA is, contrary to some opinions, not an extension of the Democratic Party. I hope you've heard that it's also not sympathetic to all the um, policies of the Republican Party. What I hope that you've heard above all else is that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America believes very strongly that we as a society are not having the right conversations. We're not grounded in the right conversations or the right values. And so our conversations become interminable and become markers of tribalism, further divisive rhetoric. They can never go anywhere because we don't start with what we hold in common. Why that is, is another story. But I believe that as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, as we begin to move forward, seeking the kingdom of God and representing it to the world, saying another world is possible, then another America where these things are more uh, addressed and talked about and contemplated, that that is possible, right? This is not some utopian, we're going to eradicate racism tomorrow. This is not some idea that, you know, in five years, all women will be paid the same as men. But it is saying that in five years, maybe, everyone will agree that they should be. Maybe in five years, everyone will actually agree that racism is evil and that anything that promotes racial inequity is racism. Because right now, we don't have that. We've learned that in the last couple of years, I think, that as a country, Americans do not agree to things that the ELCA considers baseline realities, baseline Christian values. And so the question has to be asked, what's a Christian nation if that's what we are supposed to be, where so many people who claim to be Christian don't seem to have values that are Christian? 
what is going on here? Where does it come from? And most importantly, how can we proclaim and represent a God of love who desires abundant life for all, who in Jesus Christ has offered salvation freely to all, a God who justifies without works of the law, a God who saves us when we do not deserve it. How can we represent that God and be active as that God's people in a world so obsessed with winning, so obsessed with violence and death, so obsessed with power? How can we demonstrate a peaceable kingdom? I look forward to discerning that journey with you. It'll probably take the rest of our lives, but that's okay. We weren't getting out of here anytime soon anyway. Thank you very, very much for your kind attention. Leave a comment or a like. Subscribe if you haven't. I do not know what exactly the form of these videos will take in the future. Next week, uh, the week following Pentecost, the week of Pentecost, uh, I think we'll focus on some devotional activities and we'll listen for the Spirit. And then uh, I'll be on vacation the week following that. And then moving forward, we'll be looking uh, further afield at perhaps some new material. But tomorrow, an appendix. And please come to worship. It is the 50th day of Easter, Pentecost. Please come to worship. You'll find the link for that in the description below. It's at 10 a.m. Eastern. Until then, God bless.